So give them a little reprieve. Uh, the high school, though, te the teens are going to be going away to the convention, and they'll they'll have times of rest too. But they'll be busy. But they're older, and uh, they do a lot. They do a lot of long days. Some of them catch the bus at like 6:15 in the morning, you know. So they get on that. They get on the bus very early. So all right, praise the Lord. How many of you came for the word today? Amen. Amen. Good hands going up. I hope you. I'm glad you came for the word because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna just be filled with with God's word today. And today, the title of this morning's message is Understanding the Will of God. Part one. Now tonight's going to be part two, so it's a two-part series, but understanding the will of God. How many of you have ever wondered what God was up to? <laughs> you know, you're wondering, where, God, what are you up to? What are you, what are you doing? A lot of people have. I'm sure everybody here says, you know what, God, what are you doing? And what is God's will? And, and really and importantly, the, the question should be, not what is God's will for my life, but what is my role in God's will? Because every single one of us are part of God's will. And every single one of us has the same part. And we're going to find out here, here today, which God's will, of course, is, is filled with righteousness and holiness. The Father's will is that none should perish, all come to everlasting life. And there are several, there are several pieces to God's will, but we all have a part in it. We cannot say for what's, what's, what's God's will for Mary's life is, is not the same as for my life. Well, that's not actually true. God's will is the same for all of us to follow the same standard. Really important. And then we got to figure out, well, what's my, what's, how, is my going, how is my life going to impact the will of God based on the gifts and talents that I have that's come from God? And we're to be good stewards, correct? We're to be good stewards of the things that God's given us. If you're good with working with children, then you need to work with children. If you're a teacher, you need to teach. If you're, if you're good with construction, then praise be to God. We're getting ready to build, the, the, expand the altar here. You know, we're going to put a new floor in the nursery. You know, all this kind of stuff. If, if whatever gifts God has given you is where you need to, to shine. So many times we think that, well, what's, my, what's God's will for, for my life? God has a plan and purpose. We already know that for Scripture, a plan to bless us, a plan to do great things with our life. Uh, uh, NIV says a plan to prosper us or to enrich us with his blessings, not necessarily money. God has a desire for all of us to draw closer to him and to, and to dig a little deeper in his love. And we're going to find out specifically what is God's will for all of our life, and then how can we make sure his will goes forward. Everybody, I hope, I pray everybody sees the difference rather than just sitting back and saying, okay, God, speak to me today. What's, what's your will for my life? If we look at it and say, okay, Lord, how can my life impact your will and what you want to do? And this is, this, title this message, as you can see here, it comes out of Matthew, but this is the closing of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the closing of the greatest sermon ever preached by our Lord. The greatest sermon ever preached, period, is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And this is the close. And all Jesus was doing and preaching that was explaining and defining the will of his Father. And we have a desire here, I pray and praise to say, you know what, count me in. I want to do that. Yes. I want the will of God to go forward. I want to follow up with what Jesus is preaching and what Jesus said 2,000 years ago in Matthew chapter 7. If we sit back and say, well, God's will is not the same for me, it's not the same for God, that means we're looking at it from selfish eyes. We need to look at it from unselfish eyes and say, okay, Lord, what, I, what can I do to make your will go forward? What are we supposed to be as Christians? The salt and light of the world. We are, we are, to, we are to shine for Jesus. We tell our kids to do that. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. You know, we teach our kids that song, but then we get to be a teenager or an adult, and what do we do? We turn the light off or something. I don't know what we do. You know, but, but we need to be that. We're going to find, it, find out exactly what that will is, understanding the will of God. And as we learned in Sunday school, God's not just going to flip-flop. God's will is still the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. It's not changing. Holy Spirit's not up to something new. The Holy Spirit's just confirming what Jesus already said. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's word from Matthew chapter 7. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. If you cannot find it, it's on the screen for you. If you cannot see it there, just listen with your ears. Matthew 7, picking up with verse 21 to 29 this morning. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. 
of the Bible. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to men in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built the house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Church, we're going to get serious with God today. We're going to get serious with his word. We're going to get serious about the greatest message ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to get serious because God wants to take praise assembly to the next level. God wants to take you to the next level as an individual. But I will tell you, I will tell you right away, if you say, you know, I, I, I just, I don't know about this rock thing. I don't know about, I don't know about the will of God. I don't know if, what my role is going to be. I've, I have this teaching or that teaching. Well, I don't know what your teaching is, but I don't know what the Bible says. And if there was ever a time we needed to be IBLE in America today, it's now. Matter of fact, if there was ever a time we needed to be IBLE in the church today, it is now. And God's word is so, so important. Understanding the word of God. Now you have to understand before we get to the will of God. I'm sorry, understanding the will of God. Before we get to that piece, I want everybody to turn back a few pages in their Bible. Back to Matthew 5. Okay, and we're just going to do it just, uh, just going to run down the list that understands the will of God. Now, I'm not going to preach on all these, and, and, but it's, uh, in the titles that, that I'm going to list, I think will give you an idea of what the will of God is so that you can understand these sayings of the Lord. You can understand what it means to build on a solid rock and not on sinking sand. That you can understand what God expects me to do. If you were to go to a job, you would expect a job description. So you knew what was expected of you. You wouldn't just go in there, well, I didn't know I was, I was supposed to do that. I didn't know I was supposed to turn the lights out, you know, and, and it was your job. You know, you expect a job description. Well, when Jesus, when we get to the point today of understanding the will of God and understanding his sayings, well, what are his sayings? Matthew 5, the first part is the Beatitudes. Many of us know the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. The Beatitudes are, are very, very important. If you've never read this great sermon, go back and read it on your time. It's a, as a matter of fact, I've, I've preached on the whole sermon. So uh, over there on the, on the table, there's a, a calendar or a, um, a list of all the sermons I've preached. And so if you want to check out those sermons, uh, please feel free to do so. I've preached on every part of the Sermon on the Mount except this part today that I've preached on. Then Jesus went on to explain believers are to be the salt and light of the world. Then Jesus went on to explain that he fulfills the law, that Jesus is fulfillment of the Old Testament. Then he goes on to talk about where murder begins in the heart and that God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward approach, but God looks at the heart. So even if you're hating someone in your heart, you never actually stab someone or shot someone. But even if you hate them in your heart, you're, you're guilty of murder. Jesus is getting real specific. The standard is high. And remember, this is the will of God. This is the will of God that we live by the statute. Then he begins to say adultery begins in the heart. To where even if you lust after a woman or a man, you've committed adultery. You're just as guilty as if you, you laid down with them. Okay? Then, Je then Jesus goes on to explain how sacred marriage is. That's the will of God that you fulfill your vows till death do you part. Obviously, God is forgiving to where if you've been divorced, but it is the will of God that marriage be a lifetime commitment. Amen. That's the will of God. It's his first institution. Okay, so J Jesus speaks on how marriage is sacred. And then Jesus goes to say, you know what? Go the second mile. Go, the, go help somebody in need, the good Samaritan. Go to the next place. If so, you know, go with them. Stand with them. We're to do that with young Christians. Until they become disciples, we're to be there for them and teach them and encourage them. 
Then Jesus gets really tough. Hey, the will of the Lord is that we love even our enemies. Wow. I'll never forget. Now my niece is 21 years old, about to have a baby, but I'll never forget when she was a little girl in BGMC in 2001, and she stood up in BGMC and said, Uncle Just, we need to pray for Saddam Hussein and bin Laden. And that was tough. This is the Sunday after the Tuesday of 9-11. And they knew what was going on, and, and they... It's like, uh, Jesus said, pray for our enemies, love our enemies. So we stopped and we prayed for Saddam Hussein and bin Laden and the others that hurt America in 2001. But Jesus even says to love our enemies. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, he talks about it's the will of his father that we please God in our aspects of our life. Publicly, privately, personally, professionally. Then Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer, which many of us here probably know it by heart, okay, and, and, the, and, how, to, and how to pray, okay, and, and the importance of prayer. And therefore, it is the will of God that we do pray. The average Christian today is only praying three minutes a week. You just heard me say with the young people, take time to pray. You're having an extra, you're having a week off. Take time to pray. Parents, if your children were up here, pray with them. Teach them to pray yourself. If, if you don't know how to do it yourself, come talk to me. I'll be glad to help you. If you brought a child here that's not yours, spend a little time mentoring them and teaching them. It is the will of God, the Father, that we teach our kids and teach each other how to pray. Okay, very important. It is the will of God that fasting be done, but to be done privately. You don't have to go around bragging how much you're fasting. You don't need a holier than that. You don't need to be holier than that. You know what? The Lord's looking at the heart. It's the same with giving. Okay? And, and then, then Jesus goes on to say in the Sermon on the Mount, it is the will of God, His Father, that we lay up treasures, not on earthly things, but heavenly things. Where your treasure is, your heart is there also. So think about this. What's the most important thing to you in life? Okay? And so where's your heart? Where's your heart? Okay, then the, then, then the, the Lord uh, goes on to say that one cannot serve two masters. Choose this day for whom you will serve. You cannot be on both sides of the fence. Then Jesus hits hard at the end of Matthew 6. It's the will of the Father that we don't worry. Some of you I know are worriers. <clears throat> worry yourself into a panic sometimes. But God says, don't worry, it's the will of God. Don't worry about tomorrow, for today has enough concern. God will meet our needs. When I was sick in 2002 with panic problems, these verses I memorized, this section of Matthew. And I learned it is the will of the Father that I not worry because He will provide. He will meet my needs. He will carry me through. Then we get into Matthew 7. The will of the Lord that we do not judge someone to hell. Jesus will take care of that. We are to examine situation. Okay, that's a bad situation, so I'm not going to touch that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay away from that. I don't, that evil's going on, so I don't want to be there. But we're not to judge someone into him. Then Jesus goes on to say it is the will of his Father that we keep knocking. We keep seeking God. We keep asking God. We keep going forward. You know that God will provide. It's the will of God that we chase after him like never before. It's the will of God that we take up our cross and follow after him. Then Jesus just preached this a couple weeks ago. The narrow way. Most are going to take the broad path that lead to destruction, which is hell. Lake of fire. But Jesus said we're to go the narrow way, which is him. Which way are you on? The will of the Father is as you stay on the straight and narrow if you've, gone, if you've gone astray, if you're on the broad path, well, there's time today to get on the right road. It's just like when you're driving down the road and it says last exit, last exit for 30 miles. Well, you've got time to get off, you know, or whatever the case may be. Here today, God's given you an opportunity to get on the narrow way. It's the will of God that you stay there, not that you go out, paint the town, or serve the adversary because you never know when your last breath may come or the Lord may rapture the church. Then Jesus said, we're known by our fruits. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruits. And it is the will of God that we produce good fruit. 
Jesus said we'll be known by our fruits and we'll be, we'll, the world will be able to see who's a follower of Christ by the fruit in our life. And if we love one another as he has loved us, that's the will of God that we produce good fruit so that we can give him the glory, the honor, and the praise. But then we're at the end of the will of God. We're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which brings us to the verses today that we're going to break down. Which leads us back to verse 21 of Matthew 7. If you have a red-lettered edition version of the Bible, you'll see Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Basically, 99% red. All Jesus. If you don't like the will of the Lord, if you don't like the will of God that's preached here in the Sermon on the Mount, don't take it up with me. You've got a problem with God. Because this comes right from God. This comes from the greatest sermon ever preached that Jesus spoke to in the early part of his ministry. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus knows who's true blue and who, as my dad would say, is putting on the dog. He knows who's walking and talking with him. And who has a desire to chase after him. And he knows who's just coming in to keep the chair warm. He knows, church, I don't want to be. I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I certainly don't want to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. I want to be the real deal, do you? I, I, wanna, I, I agree with the will of God. I agree with the Sermon on the Mount. I agree with this. But Jesus said, not everyone. Jesus, knew what it, Jesus was going to know what it's like to have a betrayer, a denier, a doubter in the camp. Maybe some in here today, you know where you're at. You can fool me, you can fool your spouse, you can even fool yourself, but you can't fool God. He knows where your heart is. He's looking at the heart. He knows if, if something's decaying, he knows if something is ripe. And here when Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't matter if you're a deacon in the church, Sunday school teacher in the church. Doesn't matter what your role is. Been co I've been coming to church for 50 years. That doesn't mean you're going to heaven. That doesn't mean that at all. And see, this is where, again, the unselfishness has to come into play. If you read, that if you read the title in the bullet, it's an understanding of the will of God. Oh, how is this going to affect me? Well, the question is, how is my life going to affect the will of God? And here Jesus said, not everyone's going to see the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus knows. The heart of people. Verse number, the second part of the verse. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The will is huge to the Lord. We need to be Jesus with skin on. We need to be the real deal. We need to know that the will of God is huge. If we're sitting back thinking, well, I'm just going to fit in the things of God into my life where I see fit. That's not going to cut it. Jesus said, not everybody shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, he said, but those, but those, Jesus said, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What's the will of their Father? Well, we just read it, the Sermon on the Mount. But you know something else that the Apostle Paul adds to the will of God is the law. Now, a lot of people, we just learned that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. We know that, fulfilled the law. But a lot of people don't see the point in the law. Well, the law tells you if you're doing something wrong. And that's what if, if, we, if we, you know, if you're driving 65 miles an hour down the road and you get pulled over, the, the officer's going to say, well, you violated the law and I need to pull you over so you don't kill somebody or kill yourself and so that you'll drive safer. That's the point. You know, most people just don't get thrown and locked away for going 65 and a 55. You know, they, they may get a ticket, but they don't get locked away right, unless there's a violation or suspended license or something like that. You know, a warrant for their arrest, something like that, but just for that simple violation. But the law is, is important to God. Over on that wall, toward you'll see a brown plaque. That is the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20. The two commandments Jesus taught, to love thy neighbors as thyself and to love him with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those things are important. The commandments of God are important to follow. And it's important, church, that we understand what God wants us to do. For those of you that have Bibles and can find Romans chapter 2, I want to read a verse. 
I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to read it because usually I stick in the same place. But, but I, I want to read this verse. Brandon, it's not up there, brother. So, um, but Romans chapter 2, for those of you that need a little more evidence of the importance of the role. Romans chapter 2, verse 13. The Apostle Paul says this. For, let me read verse 12 and 13. For as many have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. We need to be doers of the law, which is the will of God. We need to be doers of what God's asked us to do. You know, not, to, not to realize, okay, we violated the law, now we've got to go sacrifice a lamb. Jesus has done that. But we still need to stand up for righteousness. We still need to stand up for integrity and honesty. That's why, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not going to go into debt. For this building, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And I believe with all my heart, church, that God's going to provide. He's brought us here. I believe he's going to put the pieces together. I, we, I believe it's going to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Why? Because God says, no, oh, no man, anything. Amen. That would be an awesome testimony down at the district office. Yes. When they expend, they're, you know, they say, you know, get a loan or real expensive or real cheap today. You can get a great loan, three and a half percent, all that other stuff, and you know, be it'll be and, and, and it'll be even cheaper perhaps than your rent and everything else, you know, that that's that's going on. And, and I said, you know what? We're going to be a blessing because the district's going to see how big God is. Yes. Amen. I believe, church. I believe our teenagers can go to school without debt, and I believe churches can be built without debt. Because I know God is awesome, He's worthy, and that's His word. Amen. Oh, no man anything. The borrower is enslaved to the lender. Church, could you imagine if we got ourselves up into a 30-year mortgage, we ran into problems that could prevent missionaries from spreading the gospel. Churches are dealing with that all over the place. One church over in Vermont is now a Hooters restaurant. And it was initially a church. They could only get halfway. They came up a million dollars short. The church split. And then next thing you know, they went into foreclosure. Hooters bought it as a short sale. And what once was designed to be a place where God's word was going to go forth, women are going around in their birthday suits practically. That doesn't make any sense. Yes, God has brought us here. God has brought us here to be a city or to be a city on the hill, to be a church on the hill. He's brought us here to shed the lights, and God's doing great things. He's blessed us with 250 chairs, 24,000 square feet. The church is growing all the time. Why? Because He desires us to be here. And I believe it is the will of God that we will be here and not owe a penny to do it. Amen. I believe that with all my heart because I know the will of God. Here, church, Jesus said, though, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Anybody can get excited, can get emotional. Anybody can do things, and it look real and not be. Jesus said there will be folks that will cast out demons, do many signs and wonders. But then Jesus gets real, real serious in verse 23. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Either you're going to be behind the will of God or you're going to practice lawlessness. I don't care if you wear a suit to church. I don't care if you come to church in a nice car. I don't even care if you put $1,000 in the offering plate every week. That does not mean you're getting to heaven. Only those that follow the will of God. Only those that will be Jesus with skin on. Only those that take up their cross and follow after him. Only those that are that will make him number one and that will be worthy to be his disciple. Jesus isn't playing church. He isn't playing games. What's he say happens with the lukewarm church? I'm going to spew you out. I don't want to be lukewarm. And you know what church? You know what I found? Wow, they're having a good time in children's church. You know what I found, church? This is what I found out in my life. I found out that when you pull into somebody's house, in that big, beautiful house, a couple of cars out in the garage, everything looks great, wearing the nicest clothes, but they don't own a thing. 
They don't own a thing. You know what? It's happening in churches too. It's happening in churches where it looks like the church is doing great. It looks like it's doing wonderful. Pastor may be up there with a $500 suit. Mine's 80 bucks, in case you're wondering, uh, over at North Conway. Last year's pastor appreciation gift. But I know drive fancy cars. I was teased all the time because I drove the oldest car in the world, 1992 Cavalier, you know, and all that kind of thing. But I drove it till it died. But I tell you what, church, you pull up in there, and it looks like everything's going great. But they don't own a thing. From the chairs you sit in to the Bibles or on loan in the pews. Projectors. Many of the churches uh, are renting from rent center in places. It looks great. But when you get to the core of the issue, there's nothing there. Church, when people step into 89 Congress Street, they're going to find something here. And it's the real deal. Yes. It's the word of God. It's the will of God. And we have to walk in those ways. Because if we don't, there's going to be problems. There's going to be problems. And then not just on the physical things, but look at the spiritual things here, church. If we don't, Jesus knows. You could come up to this altar and cry all you want, but if you're putting on an act, Jesus knows it. You can sit back there and shout hallelujah and move around a little bit, but if it's not from the heart, Jesus has got that covered. We're known by our fruits, church. And G that's the will of God that we be the real deal and that we have to follow his word. And you know what? Jesus, today I'll be preaching on the garden. What did Jesus say when his, when his tears became like drops of blood? He said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Church, that's serious stuff. And that's real important to us that we understand that it's not about us. It's about fulfilling the Father's will. And there's no compromise in here. There's no compromise in here at all. We've either got to be in or be out. You can't serve two masters. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. You can't have both ways. But Jesus said, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus would say, anybody that does not practice the will of God, live the will of God, are participating in lawless behavior. Wow. And all it looks sincere. Well, Lord, we, Lord, we, we preached, we, we prayed over, we cast out demons. Lord, we, 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 we did all that stuff, but it wasn't from the heart. It wasn't real. It wasn't legit. The will of God is huge, church. And if you're here and you're struggling with purpose in life, it could very well be you're struggling with purpose because you've been trying to do it your way. We're not Burger King. Or you can have it your way. That ain't how it rolls here with God. But I believe if we begin to get behind the will of God and say, you know what? I need to stand up for God. I need to stand up for what's right. I need to make a stand like the prophet Haggai wanted the people to do with God's house that had fallen. They had fallen prey. Even the priests and the scribes had fallen prey to lewdness and drunkenness and adultery. But church, we must stand. Verse 34. There, I'm sorry, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine. Now, you know these sayings. I just went down through many of them with you. The Sermon on the Mount. You, you, you understand that the law has an, an important part that we are to be doers and not just hearers. We're to be Jesus with skin on. We're to be the real deal. Teenagers, you are to be the real deal. Adults, you're to be the real deal. Seniors, you're to be the real deal. Okay, but then Jesus, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them and is obedient and listens and heeds the word. Your children, how many of you have raised children? Your parents or grandparents? Okay, everybody but me and Jacob. All right, praise the Lord. All right, you know, you, you've raised your children. I'm sure some of you would get very upset if you asked your child to do something and they didn't do it. But they said, hey, mom, but I heard you. Well, why aren't you doing it? I bet some of you can get real red. I bet something jumps into you and it's not the Holy Ghost when your children do that to you. But here is Jesus in the greatest sermon as he's closing it out. The conclusion of his sermon. Jesus says here, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Wow. But you have to do them. You can't just say, well, I heard. That's great. Praise the Lord, you heard. But the Lord wants you to be a doer. Long before.
before Nike, Jesus came out with, just do it. <laughs> do it. We sit back and we wonder what in the world's happening. Or we wonder why I, I don't feel God. I, I, I don't feel close to God. Well, that, anytime somebody says that, I know there's separation. And I know what separates us from God is sin somewhere. Or we can be sincerely wrong, thinking everything's about us. This is why I don't like the seeker-sensitive movement of the church. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to take bits and pieces of God's Word to appeal to you for something you're seeking out. Well, church, why don't we just look at God's Word and say, you know what, that's what I need to seek out. That's what I need to get behind. And that's what I need to live for. And that's what I need to walk in. And I need to talk in those ways. And I, and I need to do that. But Jesus said, those who do it will build His house on a rock. And the rain descended... Descendant means to come from up to down, to come down. Okay. The floods came. So it wasn't just a little rain. It was so much rain. The floods came. The winds blew, beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. If you want and under, to understand the will of God, you've got to understand what Jesus is saying here. Build your house on a rock, which is the will of God, which is Jesus. Build your house on that to where when trouble comes. You know what Jesus wasn't saying here, like they say those jokers say on television. Well, if you just give me $100, if you just give me what's in your checkbook, God will bless you with a gold watch and a fancy car. That's not Jesus. That's not what Jesus said. Forget that prosperity stuff. That's not the word of God. Jesus said, but when the rains came, the floods came, and the winds come, which represents trouble, difficulty, stepping out in your faith, you're going to be on the solid rock. And you have, you have control over this. No one else but you. God's going to give you the free will choice to say, you know what, I desire to understand the will of God. Or I desire to turn it away. But the choice is yours. But as, as, as life's issues come, health issues, financial issues, marital issues, whatever the issues as they come, you can still stand on the word and be found a faithful person. A faithful man. A faithful woman. A faithful teenager, a faithful adult, a faithful senior. You can, be, you can stand on that. But Jesus, church, he also gives the second alternative. Just as he did earlier with those who cast, you know, cast out demons and all that stuff and they did not follow the will of God and therefore they would not enter the kingdom of heaven. He gives the second alternative here, verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, they, this is, this, is, this is serious stuff, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. On the sand, church. Any of you ever been to the Outer Banks of North Carolina? Anybody here? Out on Nags Head, Duck, all the way out there, Cape Hatteras, beautiful, beautiful place. But all the houses are on stilts. And basically, if you've ever watched the news and as the hurricanes come up the Atlantic and come into the sound, those houses get right on out to sea. There they go. There's no foundation to them. My aunt and uncle owned one in Duck, North Carolina. And uh, the water's not clean. You've got to bring in all bottled water because you, you, all this water, right? water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. That's how it is. You know, you can't take a shower. It's brown as can be. I mean, it's filthy, polluted. It's just, it's just not good water. But as soon as the winds came, that house is swept out to the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. They have to evacuate the whole, the whole peninsula. They have to evacuate everything. But Jesus said here, as the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it fell. <coughs> Maybe you're here today and you feel like you've fallen. Well, you know what? The hand of the Lord is right there wanting to pick you up. And I'll tell you what, if you do that, you'll find plenty of purpose in life. Because you're going to be a part in making sure the will of God goes forward. And the will of God, we've already defined, is righteousness and holiness. The will of God is defined by His Word. 
that none should perish but all have everlasting life. But Jesus wasn't just finished there. He didn't just say, and it fell. He took it to the next level. And Jesus said there at the end of verse 27, and great was its fall. Pride goes before destruction and destruction before the fall. You say, Pastor, I want to try. I want to keep trying it my way. I, I, I'm, I'm creative. I, I can do this. I can do that. Me and God have a good thing going. Well, you're going to have a hard fall. And great is its fall. The will of God is huge to God. Very important. Because it, it just does it's not just going to produce any fall. It could very well produce a fatal fall. It could very well produce a fall in which one's not going to get back up from. You play with fire, you get burned. Jesus, he knew this. If he didn't know the will of his father, he couldn't preach a message like this, nor could he go to the cross. Jesus knew who was ultimately in control. Really, this message today is about submission. All of us. I submit to the will of the Father. You're not going to win any other way. Jesus says the problems are going to come, so why are you going to build on the sand? The view? Really? Why are you going to build on the sand? Well, I don't like, uh, I like to feel it on my toes. I like to live a little risky. Mainers are independent people and they like to take risk. Really? A risk that could cost you an eternity? Are we that, are we that, risk, that much of a risk taker? Mainers like to get on our snow machines or our four wheelers and zoom 80 miles an hour across a frozen river. We like to take all these great risks and we like to do this and we like to do that. Well, that's just how I roll. I just live on the wild side. Really? And Jesus knew even believers, or so-called believers, want to live on the wild side. But he says, great is going to be their fall. You know what, church? I spend a lot of time picking up pieces. A lot of time, yes, with, with unbelievers and trying to evangelize and share and mentor. But a lot of my time is with believers who are finding out when they misunderstand the will of God, the fall can be great. Jesus gives two alternatives here. He doesn't give a third and fourth and fifth choice. This isn't, let's make a deal in Monty Hall. I'll one, I'll two, which one? This isn't it. It's two choices. Solid rock or sand. If you want the rock, you've got to have the will. The will of God. And it can't be any, and it, can, it can't be in there. Well, 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 Pastor, you don't understand. It's a, I'm in the minority today. It's 2013. Everything's just is harder. It's just too much peer pressure. I, all this other stuff. Let me just share this with you. I got an email on Friday. I thought Mary was going to come out of her shoes when she told me it was there. And she said, Josh, you got to check this email out from the Assemblies of God. Uh, because they're starting a brand new ministry for 40 and under ministers, which I proudly qualify for. <laughs> and they, they want, they want a, the idea and, philosophy, and try to meet the needs of 40 and under ministers. And guess where the retreat's going to be? <laughs> I guarantee you there's one there. It's pretty bad. That's, that, that's, that's a good guess. Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Oh. It's, it's not a missions trip. It is a retreat. Assemblies of God. Now let me tell you something. She was hot. She, something jumped into her and it wasn't the Holy Ghost. And I, I wrote her back an email, by the way. I did respond. Singing Viva Las Vegas. Let me tell you something, church. If you compromise, you won't stand up for anything. That's right. That's right. That's right. And the will of God is being compromised all over the place. That's right. Sure is. Even in the church. Well, we have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to bring the word of God from this pulpit and the will of God from this pulpit each and every time we have service. 
It's huge. And there are, there are, there are things going on that would just knock your socks off. But what are we going to do at praise? Are we going to be part of the solution? Yeah. Or are we going to contribute to the problem? Amen. We may be the minority. Gideon was in the minority too, but he was victorious. That's right. All right. We may be in the minority. The apostles, there was a time, yeah, we were a Christian nation. Prayer in school, Bible reading in school. Well, guess what? The last time I checked, the White Eisenhower is not in the White House. Okay? Times have changed. And we have become the minority. So the soon we, we understand that, we're going to rise up and say, okay, great. But you know what, church? If we don't grasp the will of God, we're not going to do anything. Amen. Well, pastor, I, I got it. I got my, what's, what's my, I mean, Rick, I mean, Rick Moore wrote the, and pray for the Ward family. His, his son just uh, last weekend uh, took his own life. Just a terrible story. Terrible, terrible story. But, you know, wrote a great book, you know, a book on uh, the purpose-driven life. You know what? You don't have to go out and read any book. There's so much work to be done right here. Yeah. The harvest is ready. The labors are few. And the few labors deal with understanding the will of God. Church, we can't go out and say, you know what, well, we're going we're gonna to give the green light to every type of behavior, every type of lifestyle. We have Christians, and, and I know we, we beat up on the homosexuality thing so much, but, but we have Christians that are fornicating just as much as homosexuals or homosexuals, right. whatever that word is. That's right. Or we have, we have more Christians that are in financial, financial, this is what they do. They, they strategize, I forget what Dave Ramsey calls it, um, but they strategize to where they go and they're, they're about to lose their home. And they, they purposely go into foreclosure or purposely do bankruptcy to fraudulent the activity, and then the, they'll, they'll move their assets into other people's names and all that kind of thing because it's an economic strategy. I forget what it's called. It's very popular today. And he was talking about how the, the, how the fact that, that churches basically were the group that first started it. It was just on the Financial Peace University this week on the radio. So there's so many things where we have, we have gone away from the will of God as the church. We're not going to do that here. You want to know why God's moving the way he's moving? Why he's providing for food? Why he's sending folks laborers? Why, why God is, is moving the way he is? And we don't know a dime. Church, we don't know a dime to nobody. Okay? And, and so, and why God is moving and why I believe he's going to bless us even more so with the supernatural miracle such as $200,000 to buy this building? Why? Because we know and we understand the will of God. That's how we're going to do it here. We're not taking any shortcuts. I've been here 10 years preaching the gospel. Mary and I, we, we, we have no regrets. But this is just the beginning of God's hand moving. We will not be satisfied until every soul in the River Valley, from Canton to Bethel, Rumford, Mexico, Dixfield, up to the greatest city in the River Valley, Andover, praise God, right, Jan? Andover, praise the Lord, Roxbury, Byron, every town, every town in the River Valley. Every soul has been won for Jesus Christ. People ask, Pastor, when are we going to slow down? Forget that. I believe there are fewer and fewer pieces of sand in the hourglass. Jesus is about to come. But I know if Jesus comes, that means the, if he raptures us out of here, that means the tribulation has to come too. And we're gone. We have work to do, church. And it's the will of God that we do the work and do it the right way. How many of you have heard the saying, if you want it done right, might as well do it myself. Well, if we, want, if we want it done right, why don't we do it God's way? Yeah, that's right. Why not? It's worked for all these years. The great, the great patriarchs of faith, they knew God's way, and Jesus himself knew his Father's way, and that's how he was going to do it. It was his Father's way. Verse 28, after Jesus finishes the Sermon on the Mount, we have two little verses here. And so it was, when Jesus had entered these saints, ended these saints, that the people were astonished, at his teaching. Now maybe you're here and you're astonished at what we've talked about today. You've heard the Sermon on the Mount for years, but you never heard it closed like this. You never heard it dealing with the will of God. And the people that heard this message were astonished because it was supernatural. It was not logical. Church, it makes no logical sense. When I tell people what I've seen God do here since we moved here two and a half years ago, it makes no sense to them whatsoever. 
when I tell them that the church is more than quadrupled in size, when I tell them what God has done financially in the missions department, BDMC, Speed, Delight, Benevolence, when I tell them that, that, that God has blessed us with, with furniture, when I tell them that God has, has moved mightily and that we don't owe a dime, they look at me like I have two heads. I know my head's big, but it's not two heads up there. But they look at me like I'm out of another planet. Can you imagine how they were looking at Jesus? Those folks were astonished at what he was saying when he finished the greatest message ever preached. And it deals with the will of God. Wow. And then lastly, verse 29. For he, referring to Jesus, taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus spoke with authority because he is the authority. But the people responded to him. Church, as I finish this message here today, I believe with all my heart that it's from God. I believe today that this message is for each and every one of us and for those who are averaging about 100 people that watch the messages on Fox, on, uh, not Fox News, on Facebook. <laughs> you know, and about 100 people that watch this, this message. But everybody who hears it, I believe it's for them. But we have two choices. Either we're going to take it or we're going to leave it. <laughs> Brandon, hit the last slide, brother. What is your part in the will of God? You cannot see this, but this is a big rock around here. And here is a hiker or someone in the middle, one individual. But what is your part in fulfilling the will of God? What's your part? What's your part? Only you can answer that question. I can't. Your spouse can't. Your parents can't. Only you can answer the question. What's your part going to be? And making sure that God's will is fulfilled. Father, thank you for your word today. And Lord, on this communion Sunday, Lord, I believe it is your will to save souls. I believe it is your will for those that have gone astray to come back home. And Lord, I believe it is your will here today to use praise assembly to see that your will is carried out in these last days. Lord, the work at hand will not be easy, but you never told us it would be. Lord, the work at hand will not be centered around man's logic, but you said it never would be. Lord, we're going to trust you, and we're going to believe for great things to happen. Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior of their life, therefore, Lord, the will of God is not going to make much sense until they know God. And Lord, your word says that today is the day of salvation. And so, Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know you, Lord, may they admit that they're a sinner. Yes. 